Okay, welcome us back here now to the second session of this week's um, Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs Committee. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to hear some oral evidence from the uh, Chartered Institute of Waste Management. Yeah. Uh, Chartered Institute of, of Waste Management. Yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so it's the you'll find the briefing paper uh, on your pages 11 to 19 of the labelled pack. So table pack papers. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Tim, Tim Walker, uh, from the member of the institute, and I want to advise uh, Tim that uh, give a presentation for in around ten minutes, and then members then will ask you some questions. So, if you're ready, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, members, for this opportunity to present to yourselves. Uh, my name is Tim Walker. I'm a representative from our, from the Institute of Waste Management. Uh, I'm one of the trustees on the uh, Chartered Institutions Waste Board, and I'm here today to give you an overview of kind of our perspective from a professional institution's stance on the Environment Bill. Do you know anything about the Chartered Institution of Waste Management, or do you want to know anything about that, or if you need to, can you look it up online? <laughs> I'm asking that slightly tongue-in-cheek because I haven't prepared anything, but we are the sort of professional, the professional body with well over 5,000 members and have been around for over 100 years uh, dealing with everything from street sweeping all the way through to the circular economy. So just as a, a very broad brush, it's, it's a well-established institution and has been around for quite some time. Anyway, I suppose in terms of the bill today, um, what I'm looking at here really is to do with the creation of the new statutory and independent environmental body and how that may impact upon Northern Ireland. The uh, extension of the OEP to Northern Ireland and the issue of the border. And obviously then specifically focusing in on waste issues around resource efficiency and waste reduction uh, as key areas for long-term targets, uh, which will be set within uh, by October 2022. <clears throat> Starting off with the Office of Environmental Protection. This is proposed to be a domestic independent watchdog dog who will take action over breaches of environmental law of a variety of the public, uh, public organisations and institutions. And the expectation is that this will be fully operational by the end of this uh, calendar year. It will have a scrutiny and advice function to monitor progress on plans and targets as set by various public sector organisations. Uh, from our perspective, how will this work? And how will the border be factored in? especially given the long shared border and some of the shared uh, organisations, uh, north and south. Will there uh, an additional OEP be required in Northern Ireland? Because it is proposed to be headquartered in Bristol. And how will that outreach to Northern Ireland? Because obviously if it's based in Bristol, it's quite away from here. And there's a, an issue of access, appreciation, understanding of local circumstance as well. Um, the OEP is getting its budget primarily from government directly. So what level of independence will the OEP have in terms of scrutiny and monitoring function of public bodies or holding uh, government departments to account? And also, will the OEP have sufficient resources and powers, uh, as there is likely to be a number of, of cases needing to be investigated? And you've seen that most recently with some of the air issues in London. How will that be scrutinised in an OEP-type environment? Moving on to resource and waste, uh, waste and resource efficiency, something I know something about. Uh, government committed to using resources more sustainably, which at this day and age would only be to, only to be expected. Uh, there's a move towards a circular economy, and that's referenced in the Environment Bill. Again, that is only in keeping up with the other European developments and global developments. It gives priority to preventing waste, which is as you would expect with the waste hierarchy. When waste is created, it gives priority to reuse and re recycling and recovery. Again, as per the waste hierarchy. So effectively, it's enshrined in the waste hierarchy within its, uh, within its, uh, its statutes. And it will provide a framework for the delivery of the resource and waste strategy, which is primarily an English strategy. So the resource and waste strategy was launched last December 2018 and primarily concerns uh, England. But given the sheer number of councils and given the sheer weight of investment, the spillover 
from the resource and waste <coughs> strategy is going to have a major impact upon <coughs> devolved administrations. And that's something I'm not sure is fully reflected in any of the narrative or consideration of the implementation of the Resource and Waste um, Act uh, and strategy, sorry, for, for England. Moving on to the specifics, there's the producer responsibility. Now, this is something that, in many regards, the industry and the professional institute has been calling out for for a long, long time. The idea that those who place products on the marketplace should be responsible for paying for their recovery. At the minute, it primarily rests at the cost of the public purse through councils uh, and is extremely expensive, which has really come to the fore in the last 10 years with the austerity agenda across the water. Um, the producer responsibility as drafted in the Environment Bill allows for obligations on producers in relation to reuse, redistribution, recovery and recycling of products. Uh, <clears throat> the, it's going to replace the producer responsibility obligations order for 1998, which it would have to, it would have to repeal that. It puts financial responsibility on producers for the goods at the end of life. Now, it does have quite a clear limit or list as to what it thinks is, is appropriate for producer responsibility. And I suppose one of the questions you may wish to ask is, can that be extended, amended, uh, enhanced in any way? And places like France, for example, have adopted a far more forward-facing approach to producer responsibility and are suggesting that potentially it should be applied to almost any product that comes to the marketplace. Everything from mattresses to paints to children's toys. And you effectively place responsibility on every product that comes to the marketplace unless you make a case for it to be excluded. That's far more draconian than what this bill proposes. But if we really want to get sensible about resource management, materials management, commodity management, managing stuff, that's where we need to do with, deal with it, as opposed to the way where it's currently left in a large bucket, which is then <coughs> manipulated in some form or other. Um, there's obviously, in producer responsibility, uh, the focus is placing the incentive on the manufacturer to deal with the waste, to reduce the hazardous component of the waste, to consider how it can reuse the waste. Uh, in a better way. And we see that most clearly with some of the car manufacturers and mobile phones and some of the electronics, where there is that recoverability almost inherent in the use of the product. Can that mindset be pushed further? And that's what the producer responsibility is starting to do. The next thing is the deposit return scheme. And the idea of that is that producers pay an upfront uh, fee, small fee, for uh, an item, for mainly packaging item concerned with foodstuffs. And the idea w would be that at the end of the day, when you return your product or item, and I'm going to use a prop here of this glass, when you present that back to the retailer, they give you back the, the fee that is, you paid for it in the first instance. So if this product was worth 99p, you'd pay an extra 10p for the actual packaging itself, and you would then redeem that 10p whenever you presented it back to the retailer. Uh, it does introduce a, a whole scheme of support around it, in terms of the value, in terms of the uh, data, data management, and fraud. Anything involving finance and cash introduces the element of fraud. So a DRS will introduce a prospect uh, of some interested parties uh, making money or seeking to make money in a, in, a, in a covert manner. It may well increase recycling and reduce litter, because much of what is currently packaging and would fall, uh, fall into the DRS is effectively thrown away, carefully discarded by consumer on the go at the minute. There are practical issues with regard to the retail sector and the space and resources to manage the scheme. If you have a reverse vending scheme, where do you put the reverse vending machine? How is it kept appraised? How is it emptied? Where are the empty bottles taken to? Where are the empty crisp packets? Should they fall within the scheme? Not currently proposed. Where would they go to? Who would take them? How often? What about food standards? What about vermin issues, smell issues? All this kind of stuff uh, when you're dealing with a, a sort of an empty product. But that will just have to be worked its way through. In terms of councils, much of this DRS type material, the, the tins, the cans and the like, the glass bottles, are where there is some potential value, or at least a flat value. So there is a a concern in some council quarters that they will be increasingly left with the glar, 
the stuff of no or low value, the high weight, high cost materials, because the likes of the beverage containers, the Coke bottles, the Lucozade bottles, the Fanta cans will be taken out of the equation and claimed by the individual, the individual purchaser, leaving low-grade material in the councils. Uh, and that's something that is, is causing a degree of, of uh, certain attention uh, and interest and bordering on concern that they will be left with this, this low-grade material that they need to, to manage and, and, and handle. Uh, there's also be the stuff that obviously the high-value beverage containers will be taken out, but the low-value items and those packaging, uh, packaging companies who are not involved and not, not engaged locally could, could just flood the market with very cheap composite materials, which causes that local council anxiety. How will this operate locally? And the issue of fraud comes in here when you've got a border and you've got materials that could flow across the border. And does that mean then you need to have a database to uh, determine your QR or your uh, barcodes from one jurisdiction to another? And how are they maintained, updated on a product by product, material by material, uh, beverage type by beverage type? Where, where is that managed? Now, this is not unique to here. Obviously, any DRS scheme in any of the member states has the same kind of uh, transmissivity across borders, which they have to consider. But the UK doesn't, except for here. So how would that work in Donegal or in Armagh? Uh, that's something we need to, to, to pay attention to. Charges for single-use plastics. This allows regulations uh, to introduce charges on single-use plastic items, and you will all be aware that Northern Ireland was amongst the first with the plastic bag levy, uh, following in the footsteps of some of the other member states, but certainly in the devolved administrations in the UK. Um, the issue is, could we do more? Could we take the responsibility and actually introduce other charges, other levies, to further, to add further momentum? to this ownership and behavioural change around materials that we need, to, we need to affect in the next 10 years. There's a national authority to make regulations on, char uh, on charges for single-use carrier bags. Uh, I mentioned a minute ago, can we consider extending that? And there is a potential for civil sanctions whenever that is avoided or uh, discharged poorly. Managing waste. In general, managing waste, there is uh, proposals now in the Envirama Bill around electronic waste tracking and the power to establish and track, track power to track electronic waste uh, and its arisings, so we can actually see where waste is going. Various attempts have been done in the past under duty of care to introduce an e-doc paper uh, web-based system, and it has not worked because there have been, um, <coughs> there's been less acceptance from many of the players in the waste <coughs> sector. So this is now becoming more mandatory that there will be an electronic waste tracking system introduced nationally. Hazardous waste. Powers to tighten up on hazardous waste enforcement. Now, the nature of hazardous wastes are uh, rapidly changing, uh, and as the impact of many of the materials we use in common day, everyday life get more closely scrutinised, we recognise everything from uh, some of the paints we've used in the past to the uh, oils we use in our cars to some of the electrical products we generate, all now fall within the ambit of being has waste. And individually, they may not cause much of a problem. But when they're bulked up in mass, that's when they cause an issue. How do we manage? How do we control? How do we enforce treatment, disposal, management, storage of these materials? And this provides a better mechanism going forward. Waste charging. Powers to make waste charging schemes to recover costs for regulatory and enforcement actions. So if you look at what the NIEA do, have they got sufficient powers to recoup and recover all the costs from everything from fly tipping all the way through to my boy? And is that tying in then to the sentencing council and recommendations there for uh, the, the actual sentences given out? Uh, and there's a whole thing about crime of, uh, uh, proceeds of crime act as well in there. Enforcement powers, powers to direct waste to be collected and transported by specialist carriers. So you don't just leave materials that are dumped in a particular area to be collected by who the next person is, but you actually have a power to direct from the environment agency. Uh, and you have the power to direct specific Respect, uh, registered carriers to, to carry out that work. Waste regulation, changes, uh, to change the definition of DERA in the waste and contaminated land order is a, is a minor issue, uh, but it's an expansive one, that just to bring us into line with, with the powers that need to be discharged under this environment bill. And my final slide concerns the environmental principles. 
and the environmental principles written into the Environment Bill really do need, to be, do need to be seen in the context of the Circular Economy Package and the Revised Waste Framework Directive 2018, which is currently uh, we're up to, to abiding by. There are four, five important environmental principles within this, within this Environment Bill around integration, prevention, precaution, rectification and polluter pays. The concern in the past, uh, which has been expressed universally by the environmental services sector, all the professional bodies, is that those principles are not high enough, not given sufficient weight in the Environment Bill. And they're only given almost as an adv advisorial as opposed to a mandatory footing. Um, there's also things like proximity principle that have fallen out of the, out of the equation which could see the movement of materials all over the place and doesn't lead to an issue of self-sufficiency, resource security, energy security and a variety of other issues which in a resilient focused future we need to be looking at. Nevertheless there remain important principles uh, where new policies are being developed and the issue then is how those principles are promoted, promulgated and distributed across the development of all new policies and are not just chosen as a ad hoc basis. Um, but as I said a minute ago, they are largely unchanged from the earlier consultations and the concern from the environment, professional environmental services associations institutes is that they're not strong enough. And I think that's more or less about more than 10 minutes. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have a, I'll just move directly to members. We have a number of members who want to ask questions. Philip? Thank you. Thanks very much. That was uh, very interesting. J just in terms of the OEP, uh, you, we've had a lot of these questions asked and answered mm -hmm. earlier of different groups, but in, in your own opinion, uh, you, you highlighted that currently its headquarters is going to be Bristol. I mean, do you think there's a necessity, given all of the stuff you're saying, that it has some kind of uh, physical structure and office here in the north to do the, the stuff that needs to do? Uh, t in terms of producer responsibility, you asked the question, can it, or you said, we might want to ask the question, can it be amended? Well, I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, is that something that the Assembly can amend at a future date over and above where it's at now. And then in terms of the, you're, you said that councils will be concerned that with all of these other things, they'll be left with low grade material. Is that, I mean, I'm trying to extrapolate what their concern would be because currently they're dealing with it anyway, although they're dealing with it with other, are you saying that the, the, their ability maybe to make money from the other material will cause them the concern uh, and all they'll be left with the stuff that they have to deal with anyway, but that they're not able to make any money off. Sure, uh, taking those in order. With the OEP being, OEP being headquartered in Bristol, there is an issue just of proximity. And, you know, we're, we're a devolved administration, we're quite a long way down the line. And just how do you raise things with the OEP in such a way that they register? And what legs and arms have they got on the ground to go and investigate? They are supposed to be overseeing the likes of the NIEA, so they're not part of the NIEA itself. Yet we have the issue of a land border. We've had issues in the past about waste moving north and south. We've had issues about how some of those enforcement bodies or agencies have discharged their functions. Mm -hmm. And there have been a variety of previous um, quite critical reports of the likes of the NIEA and how it discharged its functions in some of these areas going back 20 odd years and some of the previ previous comments about the DOE. How will the OEP ensure it has the knowledge, uh, the wherewithal, the resources, the focus to consider, interrogate, investigate, scrutinise, monitor? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm posing it as a question because I don't have an answer to that. Um, but it just seems that from some of the initial uh, proposals emerging from, from Whitehall, it doesn't seem to be terribly well resourced. It doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, bodies to, to put in place. It doesn't seem to have much time to come together to actually be recruited. Um, it doesn't seem to have uh, much wherewithal to actually give effect to its, uh, it, its remit. And it still seems to have this potential to be enthralled to the funding partner parties, which is the government itself. Yep. You know, and so there is a, a kind of a poacher gamekeeper here, where if, am I really going to criticise my paymaster on Julie? 
and you've seen what's happened with many of the environmental agency bo uh, environmental bodies funded by the state in the last 10 years, where they have been gradually but inexorably uh, reduced in the amount of resources they have, the amount of money they have, the amount of people they have. So it's just that, that, uh, that independence. And it's been said time and time again, it does not seem to sit in the same space as the European Court of Justice does. It does not have that level of independence, that level of oversight, that level of uh, interrogation. Now, whether that's purposeful or not is probably beyond my pay grade, um, but such things have been known to come to pass in the past. Okay. Uh, the second question you asked concerned about EPR, whether it can be amended in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if it can or not. I, I'm not sure what status the Environment Bill ultimately will have, but surely there can be amendments made if it becomes a matter of national law. You can then seek to, uh, to, to extend its remit following interrogation, following consideration, following consultation. Um, the concern in the, uh, local, the local devolved administrations, if there is such a thing, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, is that we've now got to a position where, on waste at least, we are outperforming England. And we've adopted very different approaches to what England has proposed. And uh, certainly Wales is, is far further down the road in terms of uh, that, that cohesion of policy and strategy around waste and the broader environment, into <coughs> education, into housing, into transport, uh, into a whole raft of different government areas. Scotland has done a lot in terms of framing the, de the, the debate around circular economy, around zero waste, around re resource and productivity. And in Northern Ireland, we've just simply outperformed England in terms of re recycling and the recovery uh, of materials. But the concern is that now, with it all being centralised back into London, we are actually potentially performing at the speed of the lowest uh, mm. performer. And that is a, a, a devolved administration concern. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail because I'm not really qualified to, but I know in discussions with my colleagues from those regions, there is this, um, th this concern that, in fact, we will be pulled backwards. Uh, I would suggest that it's up to yourselves to familiarise yourself as to whether EPR could be extended further and faster than maybe initially predicated in the legislation. And the final question about councils and their GLAR. As the materials get lifted out of the waste stream that have a value, by default that means the materials that are left in the waste stream have no value or less value or a greater, a greater cost. And there's... I suppose just a, 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 an attention being given to what is that likely to look like. Certainly speaking to um, European colleagues, they are saying that there has been an offset in that as councils lose some of those materials to DRS type arrangements, depo uh, deposit return scheme arrangements, it means that the uh, void space in the back of a bin lorry is not so packed out with, with uh, plastic bottles and therefore they are more productive. Therefore you don't need as many bin lines. Now, I haven't seen any figures, and I certainly haven't seen any figures as to how they would relate to the UK. So it just leads to a, a tentativity. There is, however, a recognition that to some regard, this is Peter and the Dyke stuff. You know, waste is going to change. The nature of waste is going to change. It must change over the next 10 to 15 years. It cannot stay the same. And therefore, some of this stuff is going to come to pass no matter what. And in that regard, how can we in local government, how can we in the professional services space assist, contribute and shape a proper structured transition at pace to something new and different? So the concern is if councils are left with uh, lower and lower grade material, <coughs> if it costs more, what will be the appetite for those councils to pay more, because they will not have the offset of the sale of recyclables. But it's recognised it's going to come to pass. And you'll have seen Coca-Cola last night on TV saying it wants to go to 100% recycled product into its, into its bottles by 2030. So where is that going to come from? And both the producer responsibility <coughs> and the deposit return scheme raise the spectre of how we, as collectors, improve the quality of product we generate, either directly through our collection arrangements 
or indirectly in association with the various sortation plants in Northern Ireland. But we need to recognise we are an island, off an island, and as such our access to markets and the number of reprocesses that may be available for this stuff may be limited, in which case as it becomes marketable product again, there may need to be new um, transport chains and new relationships established beyond into England, Scotland, Wales or further afield or Ireland for the reuse of these materials once they cease to be a waste. That's not related, directly related to DRS, but it's just a more general comment. OK, uh, thank you. Um, John? Thank you, Chair. Tim, thank you and apologies for missing the first couple of minutes of your presentation. Can I um, just, Tim, make clear at the start that <clears throat> anything I'm, I'm saying isn't intended to sound like a challenge? Um, I believe we should all of us be looking at the, these environmental and waste management issues um, in the atmosphere of challenging ourselves and challenging each other on an ongoing basis so as to achieve the best results and the best practice. But from, from a waste management point of view, can I say this to start with to, to, to everyone here and to include colleagues? The BBC are reporting today that nearly one time there are 1.3 million pieces of litter on Northern Ireland's streets. So that is a waste issue which, quite frankly, none of us <coughs> are managing right now. And I think we have to accept that uh, uh, and try to deal with it. And I'll come to that later on in terms of some of the litter problems that, uh, uh, and the waste product problems that, that you addressed in your presentation. But uh, in this regard, can we say honestly that waste management in terms of, of, of good practice, that having 11 different structures or silos, or call them what you will, in Northern Ireland, replacing 26, doing a wide variety of waste management systems across a place of this size is the best way to manage our waste in what's described in the environmental principles at the end of the presentation as a holistic policy making way. I would suggest they're not, and I'll give you some examples, not to drag this out too much, but I think we'll have to put some specifics on this. In my own constituency, I have constituents in different parts of that area who have different waste management systems because of the legacy of two councils that were reformed five years ago. It's hardly a rapid rate of progress, whatever way you look at it. And here's the outworking of that. Some of my constituents have their glass collected at their door. Some of my constituents don't. That includes constituents who, because of age or infirmity or other reasons, have given up their motor vehicles, and even though they care passionately about these matters, they can no longer take their glass to a recycling plant, and they're losing out. All of the people I have just described live in the area of and pay rates to the same local authority. That's not good practice, whatever way you look at it. So I'm not sure that any avoidance of new strategies and new policies and perhaps in some instances tougher measures really deals with getting to the root of, of some of those problems. Now you, you mentioned for example in relation to the um, deposit return scheme and I, I think th th these are things that are needed to challenge our thinking and change our practices that there will be and you, you quite rightly reflected there will be apparatus and structures required to deal with the, the handling of, of those systems. But they already exist in other places, and there is evidence and strong evidence <coughs> recycling in places like Germany, for example, is way in excess of where we're managing to achieve here. And in addition to that, they would appear to, on the face of it, have a much lesser problem with litter, for example. So is there an argument, therefore, that those structures and those practices and that apparatus has worked perfectly well? Um, I get take your point completely about councils being left with, with materials that are, that are less desirable. That, that is happening already. Some of us sitting at this table have parts of our constituencies where there is a considerable proliferation of hot food carryouts. Um, sometimes business owners uh, put, put practices in place to deal with the litter issue, but sometimes they don't. And some of the time, therefore, local councils and local ratepayers as a consequence, are dealing with the cleaning up exercise as a result of having a proliferation of businesses in that place. So there's already a problem there with the, the litter and products that, that can't be very often recycled. You mentioned also the cross-border issue or problem or challenge, if we want to see it in that context, but could, could we not also look upon that as a vital opportunity 
to have cooperation and collaborative approaches that could exist elsewhere as well. And that it's no bad thing to have two places within a short distance of each other having a joined up approach to, to problems such as litter recycling and, and waste management. Um, th that's my general thinking. And I suppose I would conclude by saying basically, you know, the new strategies and new collaboration might well be what is required. To, to, to sharpen minds and focus attention and change practices, and, and is it that we as departmental delivery agencies, if you like, here, and yourselves as waste management experts, have to adjust as we go and try and embrace some of these changes so that they can be managed as, as we go along? Sorry, sorry for the, the, the amount of points I'm there, not, I'm not sure I'll be able to address all those points you raised. Uh, I've taken a few, as note of, of as many of them as I can. I think you're right. Uh, to recognise that there will be a change in structures. I mean, the very fact that this proposal for an OEP suggests that there is a change of structures coming. And what worked in the past, you know, to misquote Einstein, you know, it's uh, doing the same thing endlessly and expecting a different result. The, the structures of the past are just that, and they've led us to where we are now. And expecting the structures of the past to develop something new going forward uh, shows a certain blinkered thinking. I think we will need to test our thinking and consider do new structures, do new agencies, do new powers need to be vested into new, new organisations to make things happen, bring them together, change their shape. But taking the points you raised uh, as closely as I can, one to one to one, in terms of the number of items that are, are littered on the street, uh, from, from a professional perspective, what you're seeing there is leakage. Leakage is occurring as people discard stuff or as stuff escapes from bins that are overfill, overfilling or machines collect waste or, or um, waste gets blown from containers in a way that's not controlled. And that has led to much of the wastes you see, much of the litter you see, not just in the, in the, in the streets or on the trees, but also in the sea, and that it escapes in an uncontrolled manner. And that is inherent upon the industry and collection arrangements to make much better controlled collection of materials. Now, the problems being with much of uh, the waste, the litter we find now, it's plastic based, which is why there's been such a focus on plastic in the last half a dozen years or so. And that's why, as part of the circular economy package, there's a single item, a single directive on the single use plastics. And one of the figures I was reading two weeks ago was that if Henry, Henry VIII had discarded his plastic bottle now, well, it would still be here, you know, because this stuff lasts for a long time. But that's the uncontrolled release. When you say it's on the streets, yeah, there is a lot on the streets. Litter is, is an indicator to some extent of just how well collection arrangements work and the mindset of the local population. Because the councils themselves are rarely placing waste on the streets. So there's a huge behavioural piece that is ongoing and uh, is, is a desperate requirement, but it is completely elastic. The amount of resources you put into uh, behavioural change and education is almost, uh, almost limitless to affect change. And that's very, very difficult in terms of getting change embedded at, at the core. It has to be done. It's imperative it's done. But the best way you can start to show there is a requirement to do, to, that is a beneficial thing to do, is to show there's a pull through. There is a direct benefit from having stuff sorted out uh, at, uh, uh, for recycling or recovery, is there's jobs. There's an environmental benefit. There's a cost benefit. And begin to articulate it and, and frame it in such a way broadly, because you're dealing with multiple audiences. And what you're dealing with in certain parts of, this, of Northern Ireland, uh, if they're, they're poor and impoverished, messages about pandas and polar bears will not resonate. If you're dealing in other areas of, this, uh, of Northern Ireland, that is exactly the message. You know, so it's a matter of pitching and framing a whole series of messages that get out there consistently. You mentioned about councils working uh, a wide array, 26 down to 11, and the legacy issues of the councils. Yeah, there's a lot of legacy issues. And yes, the councils are moving through that original stage of transitioning, where they're beginning to say, well, what have we actually got here? Five years later, what have we got here? And how do we now begin to change and amend and, and shift? So only just Monday, Liz uh, Lisbon introduced its stacker box collection system to begin to roll out a new arrangement whereby you are collecting materials, maintaining higher integrity of the product at the curbside, uh, with a view that that would roll out across the whole world. Well. Yeah, well, yeah. uh, Belfast is doing something similar. Uh, Antrim Newton Abbey are already down that road by quite some margin. Um, but it takes time, and councils have got limited time in terms of people, money, 
uh, kit, uh, spend profiles, but they are moving. And I suppose there's an indication of that, recognizing that there are 11 councils, they're all looking to achieve the same aims and objectives, rather than producing different plans as in the past. It's time for a refresh of the waste management plans. And the 11 councils are now working together to see if they can produce one waste management plan for the whole of Northern Ireland. So not R21, not Swamp, not North West Group, but one collective. And they're grappling with how, do we, how, how does that get achieved? How does the reporting line, governance, approval systems get put in place? Are there red lines around technology? Are there red lines around collection? Is collection included or excluded? Because ultimately, when you look at the bins, the bins are, and I'm going to quote a, a line that I heard this morning, are the strategic doorway into waste management. I know as councillors, I know as members, it's absolutely the thing you hear about when people have their bin missed. It's the thing that goes off like a balloon. But whether that bin is collected or not is only inching into what actually happens downstream. Because the materials coming out of that bin could have an afterlife going on for a thousand years. But yet that's the thing you all hear. Because that's the thing when it goes wrong that people pick up the phone about. What we need to do is make sure we get those steps downstream also aligned so we make use of what comes out of it. But that does not get the attention because that's all done in the, in the shadows and the, the smoke and mirrors. But, going back to your point, the 11 councils are now beginning to work together. And it's difficult, because although you've got 11 sets of technical officers, they have different views as to what the future could or should look like. And so there's a certain amount of the storming and forming required to develop a shared and common expectation. Some are saying, technically, I can see exactly what needs done. Others are saying, well, I can see that. Politically, I can't possibly go there. What trumps? What gives? Who shifts first? What are we actually looking to achieve? You quoted Germany. I mean, the technology in Germany, the spend in Germany around waste is disproportionate compared to anything we've ever dreamt of here. By the way, Wales is outperforming Germany in terms of recycling rate, which is why we're tending to look towards what Wales is doing now more than towards our uh, other German colleagues. But I take what you're saying. Germany, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Austria, they're all different mindset, different expectation. It was brought about because they had much less access to resources. They needed to maintain that closed loop so they could get materials. There was also an issue of heating and lighting. They didn't have access to coal fields and other such things. So they didn't go down certain avenues and they used materials in a different manner. Um, the hot foods and carryouts and stuff, there's a huge issue there about enforcement. Some councils are very good at doing litter enforcement. Other councils are dire at doing litter enforcement. And it's not like sticking a sticker on a car for bad parking. You're having to approach somebody and actually confront them eyeball to eyeball and say, I've seen you littering. I'm giving you a fixed penalty. What's your name? And if they tell you they're Mickey Mouse, what are you going to do about it? Or if you catch them for the third or fourth time in a day, what are you going to do about it? Because it's really uncomfortable stuff. But there's also issues about the hot food bars themselves. Building control have got a role to play. Where is your waste storage? How are you segregating, segregating out materials? Who is your collection agent? There's issues there for environmental health. What controls, what licenses have you got in place? Have you got duty of care notes to show that the waste you're generating is being put, taken away from you? There's issues about planning. Is there the right space being put in place whenever the planning application comes in for these four, five, six different containers? for the volume of materials you're putting in place. There's also things under the litter order where you're placing uh, exclusion zones saying you as a hot food, food, uh, food retailer are responsible for 100 meters within your jurisdiction that you have to pay for and you have to keep clean. But again, it has to be served on them by the, by the council. Again, evidence wasn't me, Gov. That's Kentucky Fried Chicken. It wasn't me, Gov. It was McDonald's. It wasn't me, Gov. It was Supermax. It was everybody else but me. So that whole evidence piece needs to be built up. And that takes time, resources, and, uh, and uh, evidential experience, which councils tend not to have put people in that space. Because from most people's perspective, waste is the last thing you want to consider, because it has no value. That's why you've thrown it away in the first place. It's a really wicked issue, waste. And as you said, you've, you've taken me from litter on the ground, or made millions of items, all the way through to organizational structures, at government level, and back again. You know, so that there is a lot of stuff in this space uh, that needs to be unpacked. And then you talk about ROI and, 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 uh, and liaison with ROI. 
brilliant idea, but they've got a, such a different mindset to what they're doing with waste. There's not an easy read across. There is around some of the things around behavior change and education, but there isn't in terms of organizational structures at this time. No, sorry to go back here, Tim, but, but I'm not you know, challenging for a moment that there may be organizational differences and differences of thought processes and other things, but it's the very point of, of, of where we're at here, not, not to do that exact challenge and, and say, OK, start to think differently. There's a bill here which requires us to be on this part of the island. How can we work best with you in that part of the island to, to get the best results very quickly, Chair? And, and improve is, is the sum total of this not that whatever any of us think to the backdrop of this bill and what got us here, the process, the EU withdrawal that got us here, and some of us have very strong opinions around these issues. But whatever happened before, this is where we are now, and this bill is coming, and we will try our best to, to deal with the outworkings of this as time goes on. But right now, the priority is how do we do it the best way? And in terms directly with the deposit return scheme, for example, where there will be negatives brought up, and I understand that, yeah. is the end result of this, not necessarily, it's very directly to a job I had before I came here in Inland Fisheries, is the result not quite simply? But a scheme such as that will reduce the chance of the coke bottle being, or, or the soft drink bottle being thrown in the river, where the ring of that bottle, the plastic ring of that bottle, quite simply kills the fish that swims into it. That risk will be reduced substantially if those bottles are going back to receive a small returnable deposit from a return scheme system. W would you agree with that in principle? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. And so, that's, so, so therefore, there's a direct yeah. environmental benefit. And that's why I would say, you know, from a council perspective, there are concerns and anxieties about, oh, look, we're going to lose certain material values. But that being said, almost to a man, Jack, there's a recognition that where we are now, we cannot stay. Yes. Just because we put in place systems and structures that, that deliver at this point in time, it's not, it's not going to stay like that. Heavens above is a bit like the climate. The climate changes all the time. It's not fixed and set in stone. So. As waste becomes more of a priority and ceases to be waste but becomes a resource or a material or a commodity, therefore those materials and commodities themselves are going to get a different value. Mm -hmm. And the systems and procedures we put in place are going to shift. Councils are slow moving. Each council is a sovereign state in its own nation, in its own right. It's got its own members who believe whatever they believe. And each one, in some cases, they will fight tooth and nail before relinquishing any power unless they're directed by an organisation such as the committee here to do stuff, or by the department, and they're told to do stuff. But each will say, my blue bin is going to be green because it's green, and it's different from the blue one. Or it's brown because it's green and it's not brown. You know, there's this kind of difference of, of uh, uh, this sanctity of provision in my, in my borough. And this differentiates me from the one next door. Um, and it's because everybody can see it, therefore it's a, a primacy that I, I defend that. But it's shifting. Because there is this recognition that what we did before we can't do again. And therefore, moving to one plan is a start down that road. Right, um, well, Thank you. we have a number of fair number of speakers left here while I try to get through them here, right? So, uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. Um, the whole issue is something that just gets me really vexed at, and, and I'm busting to see big changes coming, so um, I'm pleased to see it being addressed. Um, but maybe want to ask you, we would be, I suppose, lobbied by particular sectors saying that what is contained within this bill they're not ready for in terms of Northern Ireland doesn't produce, it doesn't have the infrastructure for them. You know, so if it's going to be the producer of the, the product pays, um, that we need an infrastructure first before we implement that one. Have you anything... To, to let to maybe try and indicate to us how long it would take to put infrastructure in place that would be fit for purpose, um, and is there other places? Obviously, Germany's the front runner from what I'm hearing and from what I know. But um, apart from Germany, is there best practice maybe even closer to home? Uh, to look up. Yeah, I mean, the, if you look at in terms of infrastructure, you're talking about macro or micro. Um, I, I would imagine it would be both. Okay. Um, and while we do have a lot of conversations, and rightly so, pat ourselves on the back about our recycling rates, um, we don't do very well here about waste reduction um, and you know tackling that overconsumption yes. that produces the waste as well. So it's one of those. So the producers are going to be now levied with the responsibility of the waste is your the end product it is still going to be your responsibility. Where's our infrastructure, uh, and where's the efforts to really target the reduction measures? 
There is a waste prevention plan produced by DEER that's currently out of consultation, and it's out of consultation to the 18th of March. So it is seeking to outline for the next couple of years the kind of interventions that it's looking to place to, to, to uh, play in the marketplace to promote a greater focus on waste avoidance, waste reduction, waste prevention. It is, however, a light touch consultation, and it's primarily put in place to meet some of the requirements of higher legislation. Uh, and so we're expected to see a different, more focused waste prevention plan in a few years' time. But you are absolutely right to pick up on the prime fundamental that we consume and produce too much stuff. And again, on that premise that I've said now two or three times, we cannot do more of the same and expect to get a different result. So we do need to look very seriously at, at the sheer volumes of material we consume. And that's why um, you use the Coca-Cola model or example there as well. I mean, OK, you're going to move to a more recyclable plastic. You're still using way too much plastic and you're still the biggest global plastic polluter in the world. You know, I'm not slapping them on the back for that. <laughs> uh, there's, there's bigger issues there about resource productivity and efficiency, and yes, there is, yes. You're, you're right, there are, there, are, there are big, inherent, uh, systemic issues to be addressed. Um, the behavioural change thing I mentioned before, it's completely elastic. That is something that is absolutely front and centre. We must up the ante. We must, through different circular economy type models of consumption and production and supply and provision of services, move away from this idea that everything I own, I have to own directly outright uh, and have recovery models and have return models, of which you're beginning to see it through EPR. And this is where the, the Environment Bill begins to put into, into practice some of the circular, model, circular economy type business models that we need to move to in the future. Um, in terms, though, of the macro, while we're having all these wonderful transitions, which will take place between now and 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road as we turn the curve, we need to make sure we've got the adequate infrastructure to cover our backs. Mm -hmm. And at the minute, I think it would be difficult to show we have that. Uh, I think we are exposed in terms of our base infrastructure provision in Northern Ireland PLC. Um, in terms of the, the specifics around the DRS, yeah, the, the, a lot of, a lot of uh, emphasis has been given to um, reverse vending machines and the fact that the multiples, the supermarkets, very simple, they work throughout Europe. You go into Germany, you stick your bottles in, uh, and you get a, a, paper, a paper voucher pops at the bottom end saying, you've put four bottles in, you've got 20 euros sent off when it comes to paying at the till. And that's great, but each one of those vending machines costs something in the region of 30,000 pounds. Now, whether the likes of Sainsbury's, Asda's, you know, uh, Dunn stores and all the rest are going to pony up for all their different, pro different, um, different premises and put 30 grand here, 30 grand there, 30 grand all over the place, I'm not sure if they will. So some of the schemes run in Europe have simply got, almost on a trust basis, they've stuck porta cabins on the side of some of the big supermarkets. And you go in with your bag of bottles, and somebody says, how many bags you got there? <coughs> right, there you go, there's your voucher. So it doesn't always need to be technologically induced. It often is, but it doesn't need to be. Um, and it does require a change in how things are done. Whether the cost is a low cost or a high cost comes down to, to some extent, who's running the scheme. The DRS is seen to be a, to a scheme that runs totally in parallel to um, the state. So councils per se do not get involved in it. It's funded by the likes of Cook, by the likes of Fanta, by those people who are producing the materials onto the marketplace. They then create a floating fund of, I'm not sure, several million pounds which pays for effectively the vouchers to be issued. And then as the money is returned in through the bottle itself, they recoup from the providers. So you create effectively a, a different system that manages the flow of these materials and vouchers and interface with the public. The schemes that run in likes of Finland and Estonia and stuff work on four uh, different routes to get materials from the marketplace back in. And they work on a deposit refund scheme where you go and you drop things in through a machine. They work on the council collected household scheme, so the, house, the council does a certain degree of separation and claims the money back for itself. For those people who are too young, those people who can't be bothered, those people who are too old, who don't want to do the recycling scheme, and they're going, I'm not, it's not worth it for the 20 euro cent I'm going to get back, but I recognise as a value which I'll gift to the council. Similarly, the council providing either bring points or um, recycling centres where you drop off your boxes, your bottles, in the same way. 
And finally, there is that kind of shed. It's either standalone or attached to a library or attached to a supermarket where you go and you do the So you've got four different, either collection or deposit schemes, is what seems to be the most common kind of DRS scheme. How much does it cost? It costs some money. Um, who pays for it? Well, it would be paid for by the multiples themselves. The infrastructure for how they deal with that stuff back end? In that instance of a DRS, yeah, there, there may be an issue about wash and sort plants and nerdling plants where you're actually creating new plastic pellets or plastic film. Uh, but again, if we're in a free market economy, surely if there's an opportunity there as a matter of somebody taking the risk to put in place that technology, or if the technology isn't there, it's a matter of bulking up until you've got a sufficient volume and bringing it to the nearest processing centre who does nerdalise your plastic or pelletise your plastic. You know, so Coca-Cola are not going to take a Coke bottle and just immediately produce another Coke bottle. That's not what I took from last night's uh, television coverage where they were talking about lightweighting. So they're taking that Coke bottle, they're going to pelletise it or flake it, they're going to send it off for remelt, so it doesn't come back as that bottle, it comes back as that bottle, only it's lighter. So are they going to invest in that? And now you're into the nub of what the circular economy is about. Because suddenly we're not talking about the management of materials from a single point. So it all comes out of the householder or commercial sector or whatever to our person. It comes back to a supply chain. The circular economy will see the management of supply chains and the creation of new players up and down that supply chain who are pelletizing, who are wash and sort plant, who are shipping and transport companies. Some of the conventional players will move into that space. Coca-Cola themselves may move upstream or downstream. Actually, probably not because the Coke model is very much independent. Pepsi will do it. <laughs> They're the ones who go up and down. They, they have a much more integrated supply chain. And suddenly I'm not talking to you about waste, I'm talking about supply chain and the value chain for materials. And this is a million miles away from litter, and yet litter is one of the base plates, one of the, the initial feed-ins for it. There's a report just been done, I think, which was launched upstairs just this morning from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, all about the nature of... I I've see. got copies of here. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have a spare one, but you I haven't got it myself. Busy man today. <laughs> but it shows, you know, the, the, who, is, who is the main producer of some of these, of these materials, and how then can they be taken back in for gainful re-employment, uh, redistribution, reuse... So there is an investment required. Huge business opportunities. There is, but somebody has to take that risk. Yep. Or else the state has to move into this space. Yep. Okay. And there is a question in Northern Ireland about just how well the private sector has performed. Mm. But that's probably not for today. But can we move on here, Rosemary? You're the next... Uh, OK, moment. yeah. Um, well, I'll keep mine short. It was... Um, you spoke about waste. I, I think generally you have to bring the population of the country with you. And I think population, they like to see something gained, like to see a gain by um, their waste. And what I want to know is, how, has there been any talks or any discussions with some of the big uh, multiples, you know, your Asdas, your Tesco's of this world, so that when you have a person in doing their weekly shop, etc., <laughs> they're bringing their bags into collector shopping. So let's bring their bags in full of waste so that they can get rid of it. So when they're in getting rid of it, their pound or two pound that they get from their waste can be removed then from their bill as they shop. Make it a sort of a, yeah, yeah. a circular. Is, has any talks been gone, not, going along in that? Not at local government stroke central government level. There are conversations through the likes of RAP and Plastic Pact about how you kind of, you, you close those loops and some supermarkets themselves, because you remember supermarkets have got their corporate social governance type arrangements or their, uh, their environmental and social governance arrangements where they're looking to showcase best practice. Mm -hmm. And I know most of the Sainsbury's, Tesco's and stuff will have a place where you can bring back your defunct plastic bags and drop them in. Mm -hmm. You don't get anything for them at this stage. And in fact, there's no proposal within this that plastic film should yet be uh, caught by recycling. But that's not to say that plastic film will not be caught in a few years' time. Because to meet the targets coming out of the circular economy package of 65% by 2035, plastic film will have to be included. Now, there was a thing about time frame. 
which had just been asked a minute ago. Much of this stuff isn't due to come in until 2022. So there is a bit of a lead in. Now, whether we are exactly cut and shut as per the English agenda, or whether there's any delay for Northern Ireland to uh, ameliorate and to, to align better is, is a matter of, uh, I suppose, discussion within the Environment Bill process itself. But returning to the question about the public, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a mishit here, which means that some of the, the waste, council waste thinking is, is caught in a bind. Because on the one hand, we're trying to encourage as much engagement from the public as possible and to make it as easy as possible for the public to recycle. On the other hand, we're minded with the stuff we collect. What does the market want? And there's no point in me making it super easy for the public if the stuff I gather is of no use to downstream. Uh, because if I'm becoming that supplier, as a supplier, when I turn up, as a, as a purchaser, when I turn up to a car uh, showroom and I say, I'd like a Ford Mondeo, they're almost uh, defunct now at this stage, uh, and they give me a Fiesta, or they give me a Skoda, and I go, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted a Ford, Ford Mondeo. Similarly, if I'm Hutamaki and I come along and say I want a, third, you know, a, a hundred ton of uh, BSEN 643 grade paper, and I give them a hundred ton with a lot of uh, Coke, what is it, uh, plastic cup bottle tops on the top of it, and a couple of yogurt pots, they'll go, but that's not what I wanted. So if the councils, if the sortation plants are trying to maximise their, their income, they need to give the reprocess what they want. And so you get this pinch point between making it easy and making it accessible to the public to get as much material out as you can and then making it fit for purpose downstream. And that re could require a lot of manipulation and intervention, which could be very costly and very carbon rich. And this is ultimately what the Environment Bill is about, is how to minimise that carbon footprint from this stuff. And yet, so there is that balance to be achieved between getting as much in from the public and making it fit for purpose downstream. You know, and if you look at some of the costs, you know, if we want to get to 80, 90, 100% recycling, the cost equation for that is going to go through the roof. Thank you. Uh, can we move across here to Morris? Thank you very much, Chair. I'll, I'll be brief because you've answered most of my queries already uh, in your presentation. The one point I would pick up on is the, uh, the OEP based in Bristol. Uh, in my experience, remote management doesn't work as a failure. It's a system of failure. But one of the, the most important points is this document here that was left on the desk here. Almost 500,000 cigarette butts on the streets at any one time. And the, the one that I'm amazed isn't here. It's chewing gum. Now, councillors find letter wardens a low priority. Councillors find <coughs> provision of letter wardens not high in their rates agenda. So there's a massive problem at council level there. Uh, yes, they'll put out their black bins, their blue bins, their brown bins, whatever. But the biggest tool for tackling litter is on the spot fines. And education, and education has to start with the young people. Nobody <coughs> educates an adult any easier than a child. That's a fact. Uh, we in Northern Ireland, we live in a throwaway society. We go out, we take our coffee, and the thing, the old newspaper bin just throw it down. You, the, people eat chewing gum and spit it out, and people smoke cigarette ends, and you can you can you can almost tell where there's a. a a booth for cigarette smokers because it's littered with butts all around it. So it's an educational issue uh, and that needs to be tackled as well as the work that you need to do. Should there be uh, an OEP based in Bristol? No. But if there is, then there should be a department, an equivalent department here in Northern Ireland. And that's basically, I'm trying to keep it short. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. What's your view on that, Tim, about the OEP? Well, I, I, I think that's a matter for yourselves as to, to how you make that. Uh, there is an issue about distance, absolutely, uh, and how effective that is, and how much they understand the piece of local circumstance. Certainly when Chris Mills came across from Wales to do the investigation to the whole Maboy inquiry, he based himself here and was then based thereafter for two to three years. So he came across from Wales and was permanently located here and did a very good report. And I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with the Mills report. Uh, from 2013, uh, which highlighted the illegality in the waste sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, gum is a lovely one to choose as an example. 
because when gum is actually flat on the ground, even though you can see it, if they've got no 3D protrusion from the surface, it doesn't constitute litter. It just looks unsightly, but it's become part and parcel of the fabric of the road, and therefore becomes a road service issue. And we're into those wonderful silos as to who does what and why. Um, but I don't disagree. Wardens, that front end, that enforcement, has to go hand in glove with, with education. But it also, you know, if you look at nudge theory, if you look at the whole behavioural economics theory that's emerged in the last dozen years or so, it's not simply just enforcement and education. There also has to be awareness raising, there also has to be praising of success, uh, there also has to be sort of showcasing. So it's, it's not just a two-prong approach, it's actually a four-prong approach. And there's thinking and theory all around how that should work and how that uh, should be resourced as well. And I think in this area, in environmental awareness, you probably move to, we, we probably need to move to that space because we've not done it very well in the past. Just one wee uh, big point. Uh, also, the, the litter, as well as being unsightly, it's a danger to wildlife and, most importantly, livestock. And from somebody like me that lives actually in the country, I see it day and daily. Plastic bags stuck yeah. in hedges, yeah. going across fields, etc. Et mm -hmm. It's a real, real risk and a real injury. You're right. For, for animals. You're right. Okay. Okay then, um, there are no other members down here at the moment. I'd like to uh, thank you very much, Tim, for, the, for your answer and very comprehensive answers to all of the questions here today. Uh, we're, we're all very grateful for you taking the time to come here before the committee and uh, no doubt we'll be engaged with you and throughout the rest, the remainder of the mandate and the time ahead. So. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I would just say if you have any further questions or any further queries, please do get in touch with us as we'd be keen to, to come and present to yourselves either collectively or even individually. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, members, uh, we're moving on now to have an oral session with uh, the UFU and NIAPA. Uh, the briefing paper is at page 21. 22 of the table papers, that's the UFU briefing paper, and the NAPA paper on page 664 of the main pack. I'd like to take um, the opportunity to welcome Wesley, uh, Chief Executive Wesley, uh, the, the Chief Executive of UFU, uh, Aileen Lawson, Senior Policy Officer of UFU, James Lowe, Chair one of um, NAPA, and Jim Carmichael, Development Officer, Officer of NAPA. And, um, I'd like to just uh, ask us if we just take about 10 minutes to maybe to, to brief the committee in terms of your, your consideration of the Environment Bill and uh, members will then take the opportunity to ask questions of you thereafter. So <coughs> you would have to take off, was there? Yeah, Chairman, if I may go ahead with James getting organised here. Yeah. Um, first of all, can I apologise on behalf of a uh, representative of the EFU presidential team who had intended to be here, but unfortunately circumstances prevented that from happening, so you've ended up with the two of us instead. So hopefully we, we'll, we'll be okay. Uh, we have actually submitted a paper, albeit belatedly, to yourselves, which only arrived, I think, uh, yesterday, um, and uh, we'll explain why that, that is the case. Uh, in terms of, I suppose, the Environment Bill, way back in August of 2018, the UFU responded to a uh, DERA consultation, setting out sort of the draft around this type of, of, of initiative. Uh, we did actually have a <coughs> consideration within our UFU structure. We have 16 different policy committees that looked at this and have an overarching executive committee that takes the decisions ultimately around where, where the UFU is in policy. That was all fed back into the system. Uh, then, obviously, the uh, bill itself was first introduced at the end of last year, uh, and then with the general election sort of disappeared f until we now have a new government in place, and was reintroduced just very, very recently indeed. So the reason for the context is that basically the UFU are only now getting around to considering the reintroduction of this particular bill through our internal structure. The three overarching issues for agriculture, uh, I suppose specifically, are environmental improvement plans, policy statement on the environmental principles and the oversight or scrutiny via the Office for Environmental Protection, the OEP. Um, as I say, we've only started to consider those specific points in, in, in detail and Aileen, my colleague, will actually go through that because she was at a meeting of our Environment Committee, which has really taken the lead in this um, just, just uh, a couple of nights ago. Uh, I think before we went to that, I suppose my final introductory point is the context around this uh, and it's important to remember that this is in relation to Brexit and about future trading relationships. And obviously within the Northern Irish Protocol, uh, Northern Ireland, unlike the rest of GB, will align itself with EU rules and standards. 
And I think obviously the position about where the rest of the UK GB goes in relation to this, the UK government uh, uh, published its mandate. Uh, today in terms of where it sees itself going and obviously there's there's potential in there to diverge which we in Northern Ireland don't have so that's the context around that. So that's all I'd like to say at this stage and more than happy that we elaborate on some of the points in the question session. Thank you. Um, James or, or Jim, do you want to pick up on that? Well, fair enough. Well, again, firstly, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity and good afternoon to everyone. Um, <coughs> I suppose um, on this bill, like, like Wesley, we have been uh, we did contribute to the paper to DERA, and it's still a very much a work in process. Um, the uh, so the overall writing background, um, sort of we don't really need any sort of knee jerk reactions to the, to the whole thing just at the moment. Um, uh, so Jim sort of would have been heading up colleague Jim would have been sort of heading up the main. Uh, Paper of it, so I'll be on. Jim, you want to take over there? No, the, the considerations we would have is similar to what Wesley have. Uh, their, their overarching this coming to be from the UK uh, to go into legislation here. We have the OEP, as we have said in your uh, paper presented to yourselves, uh, doing the overarching. Legislative process. We have NEA. <clears throat> we have other agents such as SES, and we don't want to be drawn into a situation where um, legislation and enforcement are proposed without first considering the situation in agriculture, because um, we come from a background where our members, uh, the same as the, the farmers' union members. Uh, our work in, in this environment, we obtain a living, and it is, uh, like any place else, it is a workplace. We have various things to contend with, uh, production methods to look at, but we are producing food uh, as, a, a, if you like, a spin-off from this production. There may be uh, other effects which w we could look at mitigation for. Uh, we also believe that in relation to the environment bill, when you look at it for the UK, uh, as we have stated before, all regions aren't the same. And I noted in the presentation you had before where the, the speaker said that uh, you could look, or there's potential to look at variances, I'm sure, for within the province for our particular needs. Uh, while that's been considered by yourselves, if you take those uh, into consideration, and one other thing I would say is to involve stakeholders at every stage that we don't want something imposed upon the industry that can't be dealt with, that there's undue expense in dealing with, and bear in mind that uh, you, you can't farm using a calendar approach. And I'll leave it at that for a moment. Thank you. Um, for that, Jim. Um, I, suppose, uh, I suppose I'll just start off, uh, perhaps getting your views. Um, one of the, I suppose the biggest issue that has been discussed today with the various previous stakeholders we had before, and uh, indeed since lunch to a certain extent, is the whole issue of this OEP and how it interfaces with our structures here and what role it may play and um, what what views what would be the position or the either the opportunities or the threats or the challenges that you might see with this new OEP um, and which is included here uh, which is we'll have an oversight for here. Uh, if I can maybe just start and I'll ask my, my hmm. colleague Aileen to give it a bit more detail. Obviously, I did allude in, in my introductory remarks to the fact that contextually Northern Ireland will be different mm. than the rest of Great Britain, but at the same time, we're all leaving the European Union, so it's how you apply the rules that we previously had in, against that context. Uh, initially, we obviously saw that there was a lot of merit in a UK-wide approach, but obviously Scotland and Wales are now maybe looking at things differently. So again, we have to consider that as part of the process going forward, and that's why you know we are looking at this at this particular point in time. So I'll maybe hand on to Aileen at this point. Yeah, I mean, previously the Ulster Farmers Union supported the, the creation of a equivalent OEP um, on a UK-wide basis, but I would say 
that since this environment bill has um, appeared and it has now become clear that Wales and Scotland are going to do their own thing, we are reconsidering that position and, to be perfectly honest, opinions are divided within our organisation and we have yet to come to a conclusion on terms of where we feel are we best to sit with the UK-wide or with the national <coughs> organisation. Um, I suppose in terms of how that, that, um, that office works, um, we do feel that if it is uh, on, a, on a kind of a higher level um, across England and Northern Ireland, we need to have some sort of regional representation. But not only that, um, the, the structures that are set out in the bill are very much focused at the, the board that makes up that committee um, or organisation are focused on environmental and legal professions or legal expertise. We would want to see sort of some sort of business or economic balance within that sort of uh, set up of that organisation. Um, and, and there's various points within our briefing paper around what's proposed in, on the EEP and some of our suggestions as to where we think um, there needs to be maybe more clarity or um, there needs to be sort of additions brought into that. How it interacts with, with existing structures, I think that's not clear within the current bill and that's something we want to see more information on before we would sort of express our opinions on how it should go forward. And I know it's very early stages yet, but have you had any assessment of what impact do you think that the clauses of this Environment Bill will have for agriculture here? Uh, a very broad question. Uh, I, suppose, I appreciate that. I, I, I suppose at this stage, I mean, if it's simply uh, implementing what we already have done, you know, where, where, where we've been members of the European Union, then there's probably no real issues in relation mm. to that. But it's just how it evolves going forward, and particularly in relation to divergence between GB, potential divergence between GB and Northern Ireland, and what that means for trade and all sorts of things. So it is very difficult to quantify what all this potentially means at this stage. Appreciate that. Uh, we would have a, a similar view. Uh, to go back to the, the OEP, we have had some discussion at Council about the situation last week, and uh, to be quite honest, um, we would like to see, um, but the OEP structure itself is overarching, and it does talk about representation and how, as aliens refer to, how they, the board is made up. Uh, we still feel. It's, it's difficult if a one size fits all whenever you have different uh, regions yeah. with different situations. Uh, we would like to see input from here. We would like to possibly see a more reflective uh, OEP, if you like, reference here. Um, again, with us leaving the European Union, there we have been bound by regulations for a number of years. Uh, everything has to have a certain amount of regulation. Again, because there's a difference in regions, there are things which would come in on a UK-wide basis. <coughs> Perhaps we would need more involvement and in, uh, department, again, with any bodies representing agriculture or producers. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about an, an industry of up to 49,000 people involved in it, and that's when it primary production. So, from that, we would like to see a part of autonomy here. Okay. Um, thanks, Jim. I'll move around the members. Ro Rosemary, your first uh -huh. list. Thanks, you. Um, welcome, gentlemen and ladies. <coughs> um, I'm just looking at the agriculture bill, and I'm wondering if there are places where it maybe has a negative input on food production, for example, maybe hindering maybe full potential in relation to food production and improvement of farm facilities. Sorry, can, can I clarify what you mean? You're talking about the agriculture bills? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I, th I think we are... Are, are the environment bills, sorry, not the agriculture bill. The, the environment bill, sorry. Uh -huh. the envir environment bill. You know, for example, I I know people uh, improving some of their farm facilities yeah. uh -huh. have problems now, although farm facilities for the same number of animals have problems in relation to planning sure, issues yeah. okay. which are yeah. impacted because of the environment, etc. Et I think That's where, where I'm coming from. Okay, I think obviously, I mean, we have sort of productive agriculture, we have the environment, and the two should go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be an either or, the two can work together. 
and it's making sure that you know we have a balance around that and picking up on Aileen's point that you know going forward in any of this we have to develop policies going back to the agriculture bill you know that actually fit, fit within that and, and, and we have a potential and an opportunity to do that going forward um, but I do think that you know we do have to recognise that as Aileen says we can't take decisions in isolation so this should yeah. not be so an environmental a bill in terms of clicking around policy development because that's not what this is really about. This is about making sure, particularly from the OEP point of view, it's about how that policy that is developed is then accountable, overseen, scrutinised. Um, so I think you know the, the policy development needs to be outside of that. But again, the independence around that, we can see a lot of merit in that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I would say I agree with Wesley uh, that the bill we can't have it in any way, and, and, and take it where you're coming from. The, the impact that the, the environment bill would have on the future of agriculture, even at the production levels that we're at, yeah. and it's, that that could be sustainable for people coming in the future to take over in our businesses. We have had what we might call restrictive uh, uh, ideas on this past while uh, on development, and this is only for uh, it's not even development of additional facilities or additional buildings. Our, our additional buildings around the gap, and we have been asking the question about the status quo where we are, and then in relation to production. Because at the end of the day, uh, agriculture can't stand still, and if we're going to have restrictive practice imposed on it, it has to be in a situation where people will not farm if they don't get an adequate return on their investment. Up until now, and look at the comments this past year, let's go back to your agriculture bill, where uh, a lot of people wonder where they're going, what is the future, and if an iron environment bill would have a negative impact on that, it has to be discussed as a whole with the agriculture bill, yeah. not in isolation, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember, um, John? You looking at John? Thank you, Chair, and can I thank the, the panel for, for being here today, giving us more information and also for the information they provide to us on a, on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> I'm keen to know, uh, Chair, uh, the, their views on th this point, really. Is it the case that what all of you need now in relation to this bill and other bills is, not least of all, of course, the Agriculture Bill, is certainty around the protocol and how these bills fit with that protocol and also what preparation there is in place for that protocol at this stage, because these things are moving closer. I have concerns that there are some heads in sand over this protocol. There are lots of the current processes that I did not choose and that I do not like, but I know they are coming. And, and my question is really, do, do you need more certainty around that protocol, what preparation is being done for it, and how it interfaces with, with this bill and, of course, the Agriculture Bill and, and other bills? Uh, if I may respond, uh, a very simple answer is yes, we need to know where we're going with the protocol because that is the overarching direction within which all of these other bills then fit. And while we can pilot things, we can do all sorts of things, uh, at the end of the day, if we don't know where our end game is, then we can't tailor the bills accordingly. Um, so the sooner we can get down into the detail of how that protocol will roll out in a Northern Irish context against trade with GB and vice versa. Yes. That's, that's absolutely essential right. for us going forward. Uh, are you getting any, any um, intermittent updates from the department or, or from the Minister in relation to that? Uh, in, in terms of the Ulster Farmers Union, I can't speak on behalf, behalf of yeah. but in terms of the mm -hmm. Ulster Farmers Union, uh, yes, there is contact up to a point, obviously, with the Assembly now up and running and the formation of the Brexit subcommittee within the executive. Uh, that is something that we are pleased to see happening because up until now I think we did, did actually give evidence uh, last week on the agriculture bill and we did discuss about you know the heavy lifting had been done by civil service and industry in the absence of political governance here. Um, so it's good to see that in place now but <coughs> I think it's how we all work together uh, in terms of moving this forward because Northern Ireland has to fight its own battles here and it's very important that, that we do that. So uh, yes we are hearing bits and pieces but obviously a time scale around this particularly in relation to the UK government's negotiating position that was issued today where they're more or less saying if sufficient progress hasn't been made by June, then a no deal, a no deal will actually be implemented. But that isn't a no deal for the UK, that's a no deal for Great Britain. Northern Ireland has the front stop, not the back stop, the front stop of the protocol. So we, I suppose, up to a point know where we're going, but how that interacts with GB at this stage we don't know. So I think there's more can be done. Time's not on our side. Um, but I think you know at least we have the process in place, but it needs to move on. 
Well, again, just to follow up on that, I mean, um, I suppose there's a bit of a crossover with, uh, with Wesley there, but it's also very important that um, our members are also coming to us saying that, uh, you know, that they're fearful that we don't get caught in, in, sort of in the Catch-22, that we're caught between you know, the regulations you know, from EU and TB. So uh, just basically, yes, I'd like to just put that point forward. OK. Um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you're very welcome along to the committee. Um, I know, as has already been said, it's very difficult to make decisions when, uh, especially in relation to Brexit, we don't all know what way this is going to stack at the end of the day. But in relation to environmental issues, and given the current level of income to farm families, uh, I'm sure you would agree that if farmers are going to meet some of the new environmental issues in relation to ammonia, for instance, they're going to need financial support because they never able to do it without that, I'm not right. I would, that's the way I see it, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, where there's maybe new technologies and so on that need to be introduced on farm, there's there, with with incomes where they are, there will, there will need to be some sort of support mechanism to do that. But not only that, I suppose, if you're really in relation to maybe new buildings, um, you may need you may also need a, a planning system that works and, and takes into account of innovative technologies um, where not there may not necessarily be the evidence in Northern Ireland, but there's evidence elsewhere that could be used to say that they work. And um, sometimes that's not always um, accepted here. So th th that's why in one of our you know one of our briefing points we talk about the the requirement to bring in the innovation principle that where you don't always know. Ruling it out is not necessarily the best option because there's maybe some sort of environmental risk perceived until it's tried and developed, certainly on a, on a research or a small scale to start off with. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's vitally important that we look at other areas of the UK or other industries to see if there's potential for guidance in relation to what we do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who have we got? Claire? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. It's good to see you back again. <laughs> um, just maybe a couple of wee quick ones. Um, I wanted to ask, is there anything that you feel are potential conflicts between the Agriculture Bill and what you've seen in this Environment Bill for your industries so far? If I can maybe just say from an overarching point, and anything can pick up on if there's any specifics. In broad terms, it's all about concepts and principles, okay. and it's how those are delivered. I, th I think we have known issues specifically with the direction of travel because we I say, you know, at the end of the day, environment and agriculture have to work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. We are farmers. We look after the vast majority of Northern Ireland's land area. You know, so I think we have a big role to play in this, but it works both ways. So in terms of principles, it's fine, but it's how it's then delivered. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose we would say the two things need to go together, you know, to, to go forward together. Um, and, and what, so you don't together, see them pulling forward in forward. opposite directions in any particular mm -hmm. way. So then, and, and as you go on, to, to rightly point out that, that this bill is largely focused on England, with Scotland and Wales then going to be putting in their, their own procedures, and we're left in this... Limbo land again, would you appreciate seeing this bill going through with a sunset clause or with a deadline date for us to have our own processes in place so as you have some sort of certainty at a specified time? If I just pick up on what Aileen had said earlier, we're only starting to reconsider this again and there are different views because of the context that we now find ourselves in. So, But regardless of what it is, you know, I'm not asking you to, to put a position on what you want it to be like, but in terms of having a deadline of it will be agreed by you know, two years, four years, six years. Well, I think in the context of, you know, the sooner we can get the protocol sorted, the sooner we know what trading relationships are, and the sooner we can start implementing this, it's, it's in everybody's interest. Yeah, get a deadline sorted. I, I would support that, and I'll go back to the point which felt there was William that we come away from about support, financial support. Financial support is absolutely necessary, uh, particularly if something has been imposed and with the financial state of agriculture and income, particularly if you look at last year's uh, income and the way it's declining, without financial support, it's going to be very difficult to comply with anything resulting in penalties, potential penalties. And uh, as well as that, um, the innovative approach, we have already situations in the event where people can't go forward because innovation which has been used um, 
and other areas in relation to emissions, emissions from livestock housing uh, has been seriously questioned and not accepted here because nobody has established certain units, you know, if, if you like, uh, for removing emissions or reducing emissions from livestock housing because of types of ventilation and that. But there are those, and there is equipment which has been proven other places which is not accepted here yet. So there are difficulties for people even thinking of going ahead, and that's to do with planning and with the, the PERS as well. But we definitely need some financial support too. Well, um, as there are no other members down to speak, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you once again for coming before the committee. Um, you are frequent and very welcome visitors here. We really appreciate your, uh, your, appreciate your input and your expertise. So thank you very much and until the next time. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Final session and save the best for last. For that, um, the we have an oral session from the Brexit Environment Group, and this is on page six 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 to six seven seven in your packs. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Dr. Mary Dobbs, Dr. Vivian Gravey, uh, QUB, and Professor Charlotte Burns of uh, Sheffield University. Uh, you're very welcome, and uh, one advice is that. Could you take 10 minutes uh, to uh, brief the committee and then there will be opportunities for questions thereafter? So, yeah. turn on there. Or? Okay. Um, so, I, I will start then. We will share these 10 minutes across the three of us. Um, so, we're here representing uh, Brexit and Environment, which is a ESRC uh, funded network of academics looking at how Brexit is impacting the environment. Um, today, we're talking about the Environment Bill. Um, so, the Environment Bill is at the heart of um, last year's Queen's speech. It is the UK government's answer to both um, its current stated uh, environmental promises and environmental ambition, and also the regulatory and governance gaps that are opened up by Brexit. So over 40 years of EU membership, EU institutions have really shaped how we like the type of environmental law that was in the UK, but also how that environmental law was then enforced through the role of the European Commission, through the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And so the Environment Bill is about patching up the gaps that exist in UK law uh, across the UK in the four nations, but especially um, for England and a bit for Northern Ireland um, due to Brexit. So our evidence uh, looks at um, how the bill delivers on both these promises, on meeting uh, the high standard that, uh, and high ambition that the government is promising, and on patching these gaps. Um, our evidence focuses on key provisions of the bill where developments have been at first really done for England. It's important to realise that Scotland and Wales have decided to go their completely different way with this. Um, they have different systems of environmental governance, they have developed their own institutions and have decided to not join uh, in the new institutions created by this bill. Um, Northern Ireland, at the behest of uh, DERA, um, has been included uh, because there was no, of course, homegrown ability without the Assembly to develop an own Northern Irish response. Um, so what we need to discuss when we look at the bill is a question of around environmental improvement plans, um, questions around environmental principles that were famously in the treaties, in the European treaties and now need to be brought in into the UK, uh, questions of environmental governance because we don't have the Commission and the Court of Justice anymore, and questions as well in terms of changes to key uh, powers around to key policies. Um, so in our evidence we looked at water, but there's other as well aspects that are um, affected. Mary. So just to build on that in relation to the environmental improvement plans and also in relation to the policy statement and principles, um, firstly, and 
taking into account what we just heard from the previous uh, individuals who were giving evidence as well, there is a need for certainty. And an environmental improvement plan is partially about providing some guidance, some certainty as to what will happen in the future. And it's also about ensuring that there are high standards. The bill provides for Northern Ireland to create uh, environmental improvement plans, but it differs in its treatment of Northern Ireland to England. So there, are, for instance, are no targets that are mandated for Northern Ireland, targets that are extremely important, both long-term and short-term binding targets that should be there, partially just to ensure that there is a high level of environmental protection and partially to provide that certainty and to make sure that we keep moving forward with environmental protection. Um, in our evidence, we also noted that the areas, I mean, there are flaws with the approach taken for the English um, proposals as well. They are not even there for the Northern Irish one. So if you are adopting these plans for Northern Ireland, then you need to go and not just merely copy paste, but actually see how to expand and develop for Northern Ireland. So one that specifically was missing from them was soil quality, something that is essential for biodiversity, something that is essential for Northern Ireland. Um, and we should look at the priority areas and expand upon those. I'm happy to go into further detail in relation to the plans, but in relation to the principles, as Vivian mentioned, these are part of EU law currently. They are therefore also part of UK and Northern Irish law. They are binding on every public authority <coughs> as they stand. The proposal within the bill is to implement or incorporate them within a policy statement that it would be essentially binding in principle on the ministers to have due regard. There's been an improvement from the previous version, but it is a very weak formulation still. And it is also a narrow range of principles. And again, from the previous, because you also heard about the potential to expand the range of environmental principles. They are flexible, they are malleable, they bend against each other. They do not have to be outright requiring every single time that it says pollution must be treated at the source. That doesn't require that if I spill the water that it, and it contaminates for some reason the entire place. It has to be dealt with here. It can be moved. They are flexible in that manner. They work with each other. So a broader range of principles that are suitable for Northern Ireland, including cross-border issues, including non-regression, including environmental improvement, for instance, are all ones that we could think about and to bind on the public authorities. Uh, again, happy to go into that in further detail. But so I'm going to talk a bit about the Office for Environmental Protection, which is a key innovation of this bill. Um, and the thing that we're calling for in our evidence is some clarity about resourcing, so uh, both in terms of money, but also having appropriate staff and expertise of the Northern Irish context and how that's going to be operationalised, because there isn't that much clarity there in the bill at the minute. Um, some clarity about timescale, about when the OE will become operational because currently there are no interim arrangements in place so if we don't have an OEP in place for Northern Ireland by the beginning of January next year then there's a sort of environmental governance cliff edge so that needs to be dealt with. Um, there is provision for um, a member from Northern Ireland to be part of the OEP uh, but there's no involvement of the Assembly in that process and I would call for there to be involvement of the Assembly in that process. The appointment of the Northern Irish member, similarly in the English context I would call for Parliament to be involved in oversight of those members. Um, and then the final point is that whilst it's um, good to see that the government is moving to try and plug some of these governance gaps with the creation of the um, Office for Environmental Protection. It's really important in the Northern Irish context to have an independent environment agency, which is something that still isn't in place. So we wouldn't want to see the creation of the Office for the Environmental Protection being seen as an alternative to the creation of an independent environment agency, because that's required as well. Anything else we want to say? I think that's all. I think we're done. For our opening statement. For our, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, yes, for our, for our ten minute opening statement. <laughs> um, okay, um, sure, if, if, there's, if there's issues you want to elaborate on, you no doubt you will be able to do that as members take a chance, the opportunity to ask some, uh, some questions. Um, okay, um, I, I just note that, uh, just because Mary mentioned about the, the due regard, ministers only have to pay due regard to the policy statement on the principles. Um, you see, the, I'm aware that um, in the Rural Needs Act, the Brown principles have been incorporated into the Rural Needs Act to strengthen that due, due regard. Will that strengthen in this case, or is this already part of this in a way, you know? That Sorry, I missed the... The first. Brown principles have been uh, incorporated into the Rural Needs Act. So, any firstly, 
this is a policy statement rather than a piece of legislation that they're being incorporated. So it's actually have you due regard to the policy statement. That policy statement may be amended essentially at any time. Mm -hmm. So that, first and foremost, is extremely concerning. Mm -hmm. The phrasing have due regard, that... So the, the current approach is that all environmental law that is created at the EU level must be bound, oh, sorry, founded, if you like, on these environmental principles. And every time an environmental case gets before the courts, they will interpret the legislation in light of these principles. Mm. Every time it comes before an agency, we must interpret the legislation in light of these principles. Mm -hmm. Every time we create any implementing measures, it must be done so in light of the principles and obviously the overarching objective of mm -hmm. a high level of environmental protection. Have due regard is better than have regard. That's better than saying, I've had regard to the glass of water moving <coughs> swiftly on. It is better than that. But they specifically, the government specifically state in the um, response to the Environmental Audit Committee that they don't want to have anything more, have anything stronger and further binding um, because it essentially it would be onerous. But we actually mm -hmm. have that obligation already there mm -hmm. and this is a weakening. So yes, have due regard is, is still too restrictive and we need to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. and putting it in legislation and having a sort of that all law must be founded on this or must be mm. read in light of this would strengthen it beyond what you're indicating. Yeah. Right. Um, it's interesting, uh, uh, Professor Burns, you made reference to the, the OAP and this has been a, a topic that was discussed uh, previous, earlier on, throughout the course today indeed. Um, the representatives of the department uh, said that, that the, that the representative to go on to the OAP would be appointed through DERA. Would you see that as, you know, you know, you know and obviously DERA is a department of the government here, would, would, would you think it would be better if it was the wider assembly or, or not just one department makes the decision? How, how would you think that that process should happen to make it more, obviously we want to maximise the role of the assembly in this because it's such a crucial position? Um, I think it's reasonable for DERA to be involved in the process as a sort of government department that's yeah. responsible, but it would seem to me entirely appropriate for you to request that whoever they appoint comes and answers questions in front of this mm -hmm. committee and, and that you feel happy that, that this is the right individual to take on that role. Um, so that would be my view. Yes, obviously, DERA needs to be involved, but it seems to me that the Assembly needs to be involved in that conversation mm -hmm. as well. And I've made the same point about the Parliament, uh, yeah. the House Commons being involved in appointments. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, in general, the NI representative on the OEP would be there as well to hold DERA accountable. Yeah. So in that case, it's always oh. better if it's not just DERA that appoints that yeah. person. Yeah, it would always you know, be a you conflict. Can always then choose. Okay. You know, some, someone more sympathetic. So we do need Northern Irish expertise, of course, but the Assembly can also provide a check that the person has Northern Irish expertise. I mean, just to pick up as well, as we were talking about regard and due regard, there's a new provision in the bill that um, the Secretary of State should have regard to the independence of uh. um, the OEP rather than due regard, I notice. So it would be good to see that change to due regard to the independence uh. of the OEP. Uh. Yeah, Vivian makes a really good point that it's difficult to be independent if you're being appointed by the body that you'll mm. be holding to account. Yeah, I suppose I picked up with the due regard, and, and it was because in the former committee, the Agriculture and Rural Development Committee, when we were, we were passing the Rural Needs Act, the original draft was to pay consideration to rural needs, and there was a mountain of representation we received from witnesses who wanted that strengthened to due regard, and we managed to get due regard inserted in it, and then we got strengthened again to incorporate the Brown principles to operationalise the, 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 uh, the concept of due regard. So I'm going to move on, uh, around the table here now, John. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm just reflecting here that, you know, with the greatest respect to the latest Secretary of State, um, politicians in general tend to have differing degrees of independence. And the, the, the uh, messages coming from, from uh, his headquarters in London are probably that there's not much flexibility around independence in, in the current times. Um, and that takes us to the issue of independence of, of persons or people or an agency. Um, I've referenced already today, so repeating a, a question, I suppose, to some, some uh, extent. But the report, uh, and Charlotte, thank you for that, and thanks to Vivian and Mary as well for coming back again. 
Um, very welcome, and there's some excellent detail in there, but I'm not seeing much in there about the Independent Environment, Environmental Protection Agency, which we have cross-party agreement to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, I've asked departmental officials about that earlier. Um, is it simply not in the report because of timing? Was the assembly restored, perhaps, and the agreement signed um, in a way that wasn't f fitting with the, the timing of the report? And separately, do you feel that there's scope to add the independent agency to the report? And also in that regard, what are your thoughts around the structures that should be in place if we have an OEP either in Northern Ireland or a Northern Ireland representative, representatives on an OEP? How should that OEP role fit with any forthcoming independent agency to protect our environment? So just to start on that, I think it's it's very important to realise that Northern Ireland doesn't start from the same um, yeah. starting point, and then the rest of the the UK nations when it comes to environmental governance, everyone is facing Brexit environmental mm -hmm. gaps, but Northern Ireland has pre-existing environmental gaps in terms of not uh, being the only one without an independent mm -hmm. environmental agency. Um, and when we come to a period of time where we do not have the possibility to go. Uh, to access the European institutions, to provide another avenue, um, it is extremely important that you know the governance here is seen as independent. Um, so that's why I think it is really important that we do get um, the environmental agency. Um, the impression I have here, and actually, point is that opting in to the OEP for Northern Ireland, um, taking perhaps the easy way and the easy route of adopting this English proposal that has been abandoned a bit will also free up space to spend more time of this assembly but of the department as well in actually setting up the and uh, the environmental agency I think it's it's going to, it's a lot of work to do both so you have a kind of an oven ready uh, um, office for environmental protection here pick that up perhaps with a limit in time in terms of how it apply applies and then focus the, um, focus your energy on getting up the environmental agency. On how they work together, I think, I mean, they're going to, we have independent environmental agency. We've got National England as well. In England, they will have to work and to come up with ways of working with the OEP. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's it's normal problem to have and it will be sorted out potentially differently uh, in England than here, but it's not a new problem. I mean, I would suggest they would have different roles and functions. So the OEP's role is to hold public authorities to account yeah. and the Environment Agency's role would be to hold, for example, corporations to account and, uh, and other bodies to account and to implement and monitor and maybe provide data to the OEP. So, I mean, as Vivian says, it's, it's not unusual to have to work those things out, but I think there are models that could be adopted quite quickly. There is a question about, for the OEP, Reading the bill as it's currently structured, it makes it sound like there's going to be one person in Northern Ireland who will be responsible for being the OEP in Northern Ireland, and I would suggest that that's not a great idea, and that there would need to be a proper office, properly resourced, with appropriate expertise, and some clear conversations around exactly who will be doing the monitoring, where the data will be coming from, and how that's going to be resourced, which comes back to your question about it would be very easy to fudge and say, we'll put money into the Environment Agency and not into the OEP, and I would suggest that you need to do both and do it to a sufficiently high standard. Thank you. Um, at the start, I think you were asking about what did you mean as the document that we created for yeah, this? That, that, so the simple answer to that is that we were asked to focus on the Environment Bill, the, yeah. and that's not part of the Environment yeah. Bill. We added mention of it because we didn't want it to be forgotten at the same time, because there was that danger we focus on the OEP and we forget that we need the independent environmental agency here as well. Um, other than that, I would echo what has been said. We need them to be both in existence. We need them to be independent of each other, but working, as in, it, there is communication. There has to be communication, but at the end of the day, as mentioned, the OEP is the one that could be holding DERA to account. So it can help provide advice, just as it's lined out in the bill, it, but at the end of the day, it has to be able to take action against DERA as well, if necessary. And so you don't have the same people populating both offices. You don't have them basically being one unit or merging too much. Thanks, Mary. Okay, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. And thank you for your briefing paper again. It's another one that there will be Holding close to me, I think it just make it, uh, so much sense uh, and so much ease of 
of understanding in your, your work. So thank you for that. But I was, you're calling then for the publication, um, for the immediate publication of the environmental improvement plans. And I agree, and I think that's a big one that we're missing there as well. And I maybe wanted to ask, in your opinion, or uh, your experience, how would you see that taking shape? Do you think that we have, for example, the evidence available to be able to move quickly in establishing that plan? Do we have the resource for it? Um, and if we wanted that signed off quickly, would that be a straightforward enough thing to do? So quickly, but not rushed. Yeah. Um, no, and not doing we, it overnight. Exactly. Well, it's we, not going to have to take six years, for example. No, but you have a draft environmental strategy. Yep. You have all the data that has been gathered due to reporting requirements as it is over the years. And that's just regarding Northern Ireland. Yes, there are sometimes gaps in the knowledge, and it would be great to have that knowledge and to be able to develop it further. But we also have the expertise and information that is available widely at the moment, including currently through the European Environment Agency. Um, and we, like, it should be a Northern Irish document, but it doesn't have to be created independently without looking elsewhere. So we have the data from Northern Ireland, and then we also look at what are the targets elsewhere are setting. Are there reasons why they've chosen these targets or other ones? Is it through international commitments? Is it because we just plain need to do this? Um, is it because this is something that's feasible within a specific type of country or a specific type of sort of landscape and environment? Mm. Um, so I, th I think we can do it. I think we have to do it. Resources extra well, would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> maybe then go on to, I'm looking at the five principles that are set out and again aspirational um, and not um, uh, embedded, and I'm wondering. So, if we were to use, like, so those five principles, or if they were to be used, sorry, in in taking action, um, and they ended up in court or whatever, what would be the difference between those five principles and say the rights given under ours, for example, the ours convention? Do you want to ask us? Well, <laughs> <laughs> My PhD is on environmental principles, also. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so. Two things. The, the ARIS principles are about procedure for the main part. They are rights, and they've been acknowledged by the UK government now as rights as well, again, in the response to the EAC. Um, but they are about access to information. They are about being able to participate. They are procedural uh, rights that are there that facilitate individuals in holding people to account and ensuring the effective governance within the system. The principles can be to do with process and procedures, but they are also to do about to do with achieving positive outcomes. And the clearest example example in relation, and it's a very strong example in relation to environmental principles, is looking at the area of habitats. And in habitats, they were used to interpret the legislation to raise the standard of proof for protected sites. Um, so, and so that it has to be beyond reasonable doubt that activities will not harm protected sites. And that was done through the use of environmental objectives and principles by the court interpreting that legislation. ARIS won't do that. Okay. ARIS gets you into the court and allows you to argue, but it doesn't go and provide that strength. It could, if we get the principles embedded properly, these two together can provide a very strong framework? Yes. In term, yeah, thanks. It can, but it, at the same time, it is the current framework. We, we, it is a framework we had directly under EU law, right? So, it is it is about making sure that we have as much of like as much access to principle as we had before. Yeah. You know, again, and, and pre existing having, problems will not go away. And having it as a policy statement rather than embedded in yeah. law, so the principles as a policy statement weakens where we are currently. I, hear, I do hear, I do hear you. <laughs> so just, just to add on principle, I think one thing that we do know is that in the treaty it goes hand in hand, these principles, with an objective of high level of environmental protection. And so the principles are interpreted in a way of making sure that we do get this high level of environmental protection. We do not have this overarching environmental objective in the bill. Um, and that's where we kind of hope, perhaps, yes, a 25-year environmental plan, um, Oh, the environmental improvement plan can lead us there, but is they're not again they're not in the they won't be legally in yeah. um, so that's a big gap as well. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, rights here before coming to the next figure. Um, do you see in terms of environmental rights, do you think that, that looking at this the principles of this bill that this could be something that should be considered in the uh, the ad hoc committee on the Bill of Rights? 
I'd be very happy. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, I mean, we, Vivian and I ended up writing a policy paper with some colleagues and we wrote an article. And as part of this, I was mentioning a sort of environmental charter. So France has a charter that is in relation to environmental rights, objectives, duties and principles, and they combine them all together. I think it would be wonderful to have it in a Bill of Rights. Mm. I'd love to see, generally, that the Bills of Rights are a, a very positive thing to have. I would not leave it to rely on the creation of a Bill of Rights, but I would say that it, in the first instance, needs to get into the general legal system and be embedded within legislation. So long term, yes, absolutely, Bill of Rights. Short term, let's get it embedded into the legal framework, because you were mentioning the protocol earlier with uh, the earlier speakers. The environment is very lightly touched upon in the protocol nowadays, and so it's down to Northern Ireland to do this. And do you see any um, role for, uh, asked this question earlier as well, of the North-South bodies within the Good Fair Agreement of, of um, uh, realising and helping realise some of the objectives of this environment bill? So the... <laughs> Sorry. The um, Good Friday Agreement or Belfast Agreement provides us, you know, for the cooperation in the area of the environment. Cooperation, though, requires shared values. It requires shares, shared objectives, shared procedures. To an extent, we don't have to have identical ones. It is an incentive to create them. I don't think it is a mechanism to create them within Northern Ireland for itself, unless it's done as a common framework north-south. And that's a very challenging thing to do. Again, because of the single bi biogeographical nature of the island and of the single epidemiological unit, it would be very useful to have common frameworks on an all-island basis. The Good Friday Agreement or Belfast Agreement could facilitate that. But again, that's not something to sort of rely on. This is the way to do it. And again, it is a, it's a combination of mechanisms. And just to add to that, the example we dig into a bit is on water. And here um, we have... Currently, North South Ministerial Council works to make sure that the Water Framework Directive is some discussion at least, and there's some uh, because, of course, the water, the international, we've got river basins that are international river basins, um, and so we're very impacted with any pollution in the south and vice versa. Um, and here we see powers in the bill to um, give. Um, Northern Ireland Department powers to change um, the substance, for example, they'd be measuring in the water the standards or the levels. Now, the more you do that, the more you end up measuring perhaps you know different pollutants on you know that same river at two points. It will become much harder to just share data and to work in practice uh, together. So we have potential. It's likely that um, Northern Ireland will have to ask itself at one point. If, for example, England, and it is looking like England will change some of the way it measures water quality, will Northern Ireland follow what England is doing so that you can provide and produce comparable data UK-wide, or will it keep on doing it, uh, keep on like following how the EU has been doing it so that it can have comparable data uh, on both sides of this island, mm -hmm. and or potentially do to, do both, but then that costs more money, and then, you know, so. Um, sometimes we speak of these changes as like in terms of big principles, governance, but even just in terms of you know the, the pesticide you choose to measure in the water, that's going to lead to potential for divergence and really practical issues on the ground for the agencies. Can I jump on the back of Vivian's point? So one obvious way of tailoring this to be more suitable for a Northern Irish context would be to look at the principles and to include a transboundary environmental principle in there as something that's fundamental to the Northern, Northern Irish context for the reasons that Vivian just outlined. The other thing that one of the um, slightly ridiculous features of the way that um, this whole process is unfolding is it's beginning to look like England, Scotland, possibly Northern Ireland, will be gathering different types of data to be analysing the same environmental changes. Um, and that's incredibly problematic if you're trying to work out what your, what your common targets are and how you're going to get there. If you're measuring things in different ways, you want to be using similar kinds of data that everyone can understand the, sort of the problem in the same way. Which is why we need continued membership of, of the, the European, European Environment Agency. I thought you were going to say the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> not going to be that political today. <laughs> Claire, you want I to... I just wanted to maybe follow up on that point. It was interesting what you were saying. So if Northern Ireland chooses to follow the way that England are going to collect this data or, or in order to have a UK-wide framework, I mean, we already know that Wales and Scotland are going to go their own way anyway. So there is highly 
a telly or like you were going to have a UK data set anyway, I think given the two regions are going... I think that's to be negotiated and decided. And that will be done through a common framework rather than legislative processes? I mean, some common frameworks can theoretically have a legislative backing, but yes, it does look like the direction of travel is the least legal possible yeah. uh, for common frameworks, which is very concerning. Because of course, the starting point is directives that are legally binding on every member of the European Union, and now you're moving into political agreement between four parts of the UK. So we're seeing the beginning of... Paper returns. Yeah. You, th there will be no UK joined up ways of measuring and delivering very much well, it uh, could anymore. Be, it could be that one area will go and focus primarily yeah. on specific things and then it will gather, gather just enough data that the other ones are interested in and provide them. Yeah. But all of this requires extra resources yeah. and so that just makes it much more challenging. Okay. Okay, um, I've, as we have no more speakers, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, coming before you today and for, for, um, yourself, uh, Professor Burns, for making your way from uh, Sheffield uh, yep. to, to be with. We appreciate that effort and time that you've taken. So thank you very much and we'll be seeing you again. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, uh, just folks, um, the members are going to be business of Australia's. Okay. Nope. okay, I want to inform members the next meeting is Thursday, 5th of March uh, 2020 at 10 a.m. in room 30, and this will be uh, another all-day meeting. So, the last, the last, uh, last of the, the, the all-day meeting. So.